that ends up being healthy. What? <laughs> I'm thinking that the one downside to moving to Sunday mornings is that our pre-show is uh, not very stimulating. <laughs> it's very quiet. We're not, we're not engaged. We're not engaged yet because we're all like still kind of waking up and the yeah. Nice, the nice thing is, is that, that you do this and then you have the rest of the day to do whatever you want. You our, I have to our, work, but yeah work is okay work is fine i do work thanksgiving too Ugh. oh so we're doing a potluck and we, we got a, a sheet to put in what we're bringing and i put in their empty stomach ha! nice what are you bringing this my belly wow <laughs> Well, I'm terrible at, if I promise to bring something, um, don't count that I'll actually bring it. Because you'll forget? I'll totally forget. Yep. Yeah. For or, me, my or usual... I won't forget. Uh, on occasion, I've been, able, uh, been successful. But... With me and potlucks, my usual thing is I most of the time ride the bus to work, and it's very hard to carry something on the bus to work. Like anything, I mean, I could put something in a if I could put it in a some in a tray and then put it in a bag to carry in like 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 this, I might be okay. But you know, there's not always room. It's gonna have to maybe sit on my lap. It's a whole to do, and it's not something I'm the biggest fan of doing every once in a while. But um, you can get me for like, you can bring like the napkins and paper towels or silver or you know plastic silverware or whatever that I'm cool with. Other things, not so much. Every once in a while, I mean, I could do like sodas, like if I can buy a soda, like there. Or, nearby <laughs> what? What is I'm, I'm amused by our guests change of venue scenic location slash Sunday brunch look or whatever it is what I do. <laughs> going on. It's the welcome to my home of podcasts. Uh, I, 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 said, I said he was so hyper masculine that he's like, oh, I need a, uh, I need a, a totally counterbalance that. Like, hold, hold my purse. No! <laughs> yeah, I'm so hard. Hold my too purse. Far, too far! Too <laughs> far! <laughs> I go. thought I thought the wrap that is a baby soft pink was a nice touch. It's a little right. more rose than it is. Baby pink, but yeah. Oh God! <laughs> what are we in the eighties? I'm doing Ladies my pet dinner We oh, will like... be invincible. Oh. <laughs> I was gonna say, is that the latest WeHo look? Is that what you're sporting? You ho. We ho. <laughs> I'm surprised, it. Adrian. No, it's just. Using, uh, I'm surprised you're not using like AirPods. <gasps> um, 
I don't have those. <laughs> um, I do. Dun, 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 dun. This is this is my work headset, and really the microphone is just fucking incredible. And I can't. You guys need to hear me more than I need to hear you. Oh, God. Well, is that okay to say? I feel like that's a bad thing. <laughs> that's like a Mariah Carey thing to say. Can they hear me? That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I need more audio. I need it up and the, up and the, yeah. The Turn me up. Turn me up, honey. Turn me up. I uh. I don't know. I mean, how much of a diva are you going to turn into? I mean, if you want to have some hot tea and a wrap and, you know, move your mouth uh-huh. to the words but not actually do any work. How much, how much diva do I want to turn into? How much of this do I want to smoke? Let me think. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look at my game and, oh, this is so distracting. Let me just distract myself. But no, um, this this sounds a lot better, and um, I've I've tried to do these things with stereo headphones before, and I can't hear my environment, so I'm either being too loud or, um, oh, I don't know, it doesn't sound right. So I, I need I need the the feedback of my own voice, or I I can't control my volume right. I gotcha. No, and I've tried having you guys on speakers before too, and that works well, but I don't I, I don't feel like it's intimate. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, uh. Da, 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 da. I like it when you guys are whispering in my ear. <laughs> so, uh, hey, Drew. <laughs> no. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah, no. Yes, Daddy. Yeah, tell me. <laughs> tell me all about it. Hey, Adrian, we're live and we have a live chat over on our YouTube channel. So, we oh. prints to that. Um, okay. Is this the just, Telegram chat? No, no, it's no, um, no, it's, it's on YouTube because YouTube, YouTube, we broadcast. Oh, of live. course it is. Oh, I like that. Okay. So, uh, one of our chat members said they want to hear you say, "That's it, right there." That's it, right there. Fuck you. What? No, no, no just. <laughs> <laughs> If we're going to be doing that this whole show. <laughs> the cameras will not be on and, hey, and uh, David will not be wearing any clothes probably. So, well, there's that. I just don't need that right now. <laughs> I mean, the camera is only really getting you from like the chest I top. I need that right now. I know, but still. Just, yeah. It's, it's... I mean, we technically can do this pantsless. No, no. What makes you think that we're all wearing pants? I mean, you do have a point. <laughs> oh, it says, just play a shampoo commercial in the background. Nothing like guys moaning about their hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, Did, wasn't there a parody of that, like on... Um, one of those comedy things or something about if if men had shampoo commercials like women. Maybe. It's hard to remember. Like college humor or somebody did it, I think. You can't. Oh, there was really there was a flipping hair there, as much. There was a Brazilian commercial where a guy was in in his office and his hair was like flowing and in the background and just flying over those very beautifully. And it's because he had used something like herbal essences that morning and his coworkers were making fun of him for it. So they told him, hey, you know, maybe try a man's shampoo. And then he came in and his hair was tame and looking professional. It was a little tiny bit sexist. It was okay for the South American market, but it was cute. (laughs) Yeah, it was problematic. But it was super cute, though, because the guy is like just totally nonchalant, running, walking around his office cubicle farm with his hair just gorgeous, fanning out. It was really they did a really good job with it. <laughs> Where is? Uh oh, he's in the chat. We're all in trouble now. <laughs> or this could be the best show ever. And... We already got some of the best show ever earlier oh before, really now <laughs> before we went yeah. live <laughs> yeah well yeah you know at this point in the show he could have done the same thing because we haven't no. actually shown anybody anything but no 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 we can only hear not see no 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 
now. Speaking of <laughs> ASMR, which I already said no to, let's <laughs> move Ooh, on and get started because we're running behind. Yeah. Yes. That's a, that's a new ASMR. It's just the uh, a scruffy daddy voice talking lowly, grumbly. It's like the ASMR. I'm surprised that hasn't happened yet. See, that could be a new category on like XTube or even Pornhub. The sexy ASMR. I think I think a lot of that is like it's a, it'll be a woman. She's like cuddling you or like. Hi there. Do you want me to play with your nipples? Mm-hmm. You know, that sort of thing. Like they leave their weird, sexy, gross in your ear talk, which I fucking hate. And they just get right up in your ear and say all kinds of weird things like, have you been a good boy today? <laughs> so I guess this is not a business opportunity for Adrian. <laughs> it, no, I hate ASMR so much. It is so creepy and grosses me out. I mean, not not knocking anyone who's into it. It's me personally. It just It's this like... It's in my freaking skull and it's gross. Like, I don't want to hear your tongue moving around in there. Okay. What? Like, you can hear their mouth, like the mouth sounds like their tongue moving against their teeth. You can hear all this weird detail and I can't deal with that. I can deal, the wording and everything they're saying is fine and get on them, but the sound effects really get to me. Mm. Like the ASMR where it's just the, the girl. With really close to the mic and like crunching on ice. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. God. No. 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 Done. Out. Thanks. We're good. All right. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Tubs. But if it was bare HSMR, then I might be into it if it got nice visuals. <laughs> oh, crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Well, I'm pretty sure it's A S. Yeah, it's A M A as an alpha. Correct. Okay. But since they're not near each other. Century Meridian response. You probably use the H for like her suit. Haha. Ha. Yeah. <sighs> There's a lot of angles yes. in that visual. Uh-huh. The sole purpose of ASMR is to relax people. The ASMR community is constantly growing on YouTube. Ideally, ASMR videos are meant to give the user a relaxing angle at the back of their head and or spine. ASMR videos usually involve one of the following. Gentle whispering, relaxing hand movements, smacking of the lips, nail tapping, <laughs> scratching on hard surfaces such as tables, brushing sounds, etc. Wow, that's actually for for being a, a, a de- top definition urban dictionary. That's actually relatively accurate. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Another one, ASMR. That tingling feeling you get when somebody says. Mufasa. <laughs> That's fair. Say it. Uh, Mufasa. Ooh, say ooh. it again. Say it again. I just felt Mufasa, 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 Mufasa. Ah! Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Alrighty. Shall we begin? Uh, should we? Drop and roll? I, yeah, I think should. so. It's quarter after the hour. Yeah. Enough digression. I like how Gary's getting his think red carpet eyes going. <laughs> what? I'm awake. I'm awake. You were like trying to. <laughs> I'm awake. He, my, he was doing the eye drops thing. My eyes dry out when I sleep, and so and my eyelids like my eyelashes want to stick together, so I'm just like having an issue. I got oil of in my eyes. <laughs> Well, it's not cream of some young guy, so there you go. Oh, yeah. uh, oh quick comment. Um, in order to hear sounds, I have to share my screen, but I only do that at the beginning of the show. Um, so we get through the first part. Um, after that, uh, uh, I stop that 
because it takes up bandwidth, and so you don't hear the closing music. So just ask that you mute yourself when the when after saying goodnight, and then I'll say something, which means we can resume. Cool. Since Daddy Hadrian wasn't here last time, or, or that wasn't the case last time Hadrian was here, so. Ah, uh, where were we? All right. Here we go. In three, two. Sunday, November, it's not the 11th, day it's the 18th. 18th, 2018, I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right, I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea, I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Don't hurt nobody with your bad self. And welcome to Comes Out Loud, the Bear Podcast of Indeterminate Length, episode number 487, and we have the ever gorgeous Hadrian with us. Yay! Ooh. And uh, uh, you know what? Whenever we bring Hadrian on, it's usually to do this. Let's talk about sex. Because he's a sex. Mofo. Isn't that right? That I got no complaints here. Can we? You can, can we hear you? Can we hear you, Hater? Can you talk? Nope. We can't hear you. You muted. <laughs> I'm muted. I'm sorry. I said some funny things too, but I forgot them now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hello, guys. It's so wonderful to be here again. Yay! Welcome back. We we uh, are glad you're here. Uh, so, Gary, what was one of the many reasons that we bring Hadrian? What is today's reason? Uh, so we did a previous show uh, talking about the DL or the download. Yes, that we talk about sex. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting to that. <clears throat> so <laughs> you guys should put da- uh, put Daddy Gary on top of Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure you got it right. Um... <laughs> I mean, we're just living up to stereotype. Everyone, you know, wants Daydream to be on top, and I'm known as a bossy bottom. So there you go. Um, here's here's the thing. We did a previous show on the DL or the down low, and we discussed its definition in that. And then we had a subscriber uh, individual comment and wanted to know if we would talk about our own experiences. Um, if you recall, we had feedback and this person said they really appreciated how open we were about that. Some people are on the DL because of, uh, could be spiritual or religious, you know, cultural community issues, um, family. There's a, there's a ton of stuff that's wrapped up in that. So I was like, well, this could be an interesting discussion. And of course, if we're going to spill all the tea about that, we thought who better to have a log than Hadrian from the West coast. One of the most infamous horse. I mean, celebs who's retired from the biz. (laughs) Who's the horse now? (laughs) I kid. Um, but you've been a really good uh, returning guest for us to have on and, and discuss things. And you're pretty much an open book to our knowledge about your experiences. And uh, we respect your opinion on things. And so we thought, what the heck, we'll, we'll see if we can get him to, to come join us. Wonderful. I'm very happy to be here. So um, here's uh, – there's just a couple of questions I had as general ideas and since we're going to focus mostly on our experiences, do any of us recall our first DL experience? It may or may not stand out. Um, I can't remember my exact first, but I kind of remember my life at that time when I was meeting men and uh, not in a you know 
public pickup kind of, you know, Tinder swipe, whatever kind of age. <laughs> so funny. Um, I can actually, I can't necessarily remember my first first because that may be like, because technically I was on the DL with a friend while I was in middle school playing around in churches and stuff. But I won't go to that one. <laughs> I will start with um, my technically my first boyfriend. Um, when I was um, in college, I was on, if you remember Yahoo chat of all places, um, mm -hmm. I met a man from um, my hometown, Louisville. Um, and we started talking and he was very interested in meeting up when I was coming into town next time. So we met up, we went to an apartment, we had a really amazing, fucking awesome sexual time. Um, he was a gorgeous bear, um, dark fur, light eyes, very just sweet and cuddly and hot. And um, he, <laughs> he had picked me up at the McDonald's near my house and we drove all the way across t the Aww. city to like another like i think st matthews or something. We, we drove pretty distance good distance away and then we went to this apartment um met up fucked um talked found out we liked each other a lot and became quote-unquote boyfriends um i noticed very quickly um hindsight being 2020 that he was very not very giving about details about his life um, on top of that, then um, um, he came down and visited me once while I was in college. Um, and then I noticed the um, children's stuff in the back seat. Like there was a there was a um, car seat or something like that and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, well, that's not that's new. And he goes, yes, I have I have a child. And I'm like, okay, cool, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. Well, it gets better. Not really. <laughs> um, uh, turns out that I mean we we went to a hotel and we you know did everything and we really cared for each other and da da da. So I came home for I'm thinking Thanksgiving um, break, and he we decided to meet up again. Um, he picked me up at my parents' house or my mom's house. We drove, but we we stopped in a parking lot and. I was like, okay, I would really rather not do stuff here, because you know it was it was morning, not like mid more like early morning where like maybe people were just getting up. This was like ten o'clock when things were kind of getting busy. Um, and he stopped the car and he wanted to tell me something, and I was like, okay, what do you want to tell me? And he wanted to tell me that he was married, and um, he told me he was married. He told me he was. Um, you know, had a kid and all that stuff. And I was like, okay. And being the young 18, 19 year old, 19, 20 year old, excuse me, I was at that time. I was like, sure, it's okay. No problem. Whatever. What you, what, what, what time period would this been in? This this been I think 90, that's important. Over the last 20 years, there's a lot of differences in time periods. Yeah. This sure. would have been 98, 99. This would have been okay. like, yeah. So this would have been, this would have been 98. This would have been my first year at college. And yeah. Literally, like the first few months of my freshman year of college. Um, <laughs> so we went now to his home to mess around, um, which was super fucking awkward for various reasons. Stepping um, over the Fisher Price. <laughs> yeah, stepping over the toys. Um, we did it in their bed. Um, Ooh. Yeah, yeah, honey. Oh. Yeah. That's hot. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was My my my. It was I wouldn't a mind good doing time. that. It was a really fun experience, but afterwards after he, he the worst part was the reason he had the time off, like the day off from work and everything was because he was going to a funeral. So <gasps> he, he, so he we literally played and then he got ready for the funeral. Dropped me off and then went to the funeral. Yeah, mm. yeah. I'm assuming to meet his wife there. I don't know. I don't remember who it was that died. I'm hoping to God it wasn't like a like a father, grandfather, or something on her side or some shit like that. I would have been. It would have made the well. Basically, afterwards, I felt really fucking awkward, and that's kind of why I ended it because it was it it was very much I was feeling like the other woman, other man yeah. kind of thing. 
just very like while I like you a lot and I appreciate you know love the times we spend together this isn't working <laughs> and essentially we did meet up a year later um, and I found out that he did eventually come out to his wife um, and um, I don't know what happened after that I don't know if they were divorcing or they were staying together for the kid or whatever and at that point I didn't care I had moved on I know that sounds Sadie but I, I didn't you know no, I you're right. There's, and we're good now. Did we? You don't have to. You don't have to justify ending an affair ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fine. I mean, we met the the second time, and that was nice. <laughs> right. But he was he was you know freer, and I, I know I I would love to know where he is now, given how long it's been. Um, I don't know if he's still in Wolf. I don't know anything about him. I know for while I was in college. Because he was a bear, and he found himself attracted to bears, so he was going along with the crowd of guys that I was talking to in the city. So I was able to kind of connect dots and find out who he was and kind of get an idea for, at least while I was in college, of where he's been, where he was going. And it seemed to me that he was, he was um, learning more about himself, finding more things. I think he had found a bear community, but... To this day, now I don't I don't know where he is, and and hmm. that's probably good. Like now, probably gosh, 10, 15 years, fifteen years almost. So, who knows? So funnily enough, now? that you mentioned this story, uh, we have a surprise guest on today's show. No. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's done but podcasting. It was, it was it was a very interesting experience, and um. One, I appreciate only because I learned for me that one of the things I didn't necessarily want to be was like that, if we're going to be in a relationship kind of thing, I don't want to be the other man. Like, right. if, if we're going to be, if you're going to, if I'm fine with you playing on the DL or whatever, but we're, that's just like it. Like, this isn't like relationship territory, lovey-dovey bullshit. No, I don't know. And I think you bring up a really good point, Damon, about um, I think people confuse that uh, when we talk about download experiences or on the side or however it wants to be phrased, people think like it's just sex. And that makes sense. But I think there's a whole realm of possibilities and everybody goes into that with their own concept and you kind of need to make your own rules, I guess. Yeah. Like that play out. And so you basically was like, you're nice. However, uh-huh. there's a whole lot of stuff about this that I'm not agreeing with. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that uh, in the live chat, Dogai said that a new sin was created, apparently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, affair, adultery is kind of the same thing. It doesn't really... It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're. Right. I don't think there's any definitions that are any rules. It's kind of like whether or not there are children involved, whether or not you know there's a wedding, funeral, whatever, anything in between. <laughs> the whole funeral thing was the thing that really caught me because it's like, yeah, I mean, that was like it was like I, I I know you didn't you don't have a whole lot of time because you know you have to get around your wife and your child and uh, so there's there's certainly a. There's some there's certainly certain levels of desperation that some of these guys give off a vibe they put off like there's the I'm I will only screw around at the the bookstore or the the park or wherever the cruising zone is they'll go there and get it you know they're ordering in so to speak they're like hey I'm here to eat and then I'm gonna run the other guys they'll go there and they're like hey I'm gonna order to go how about we go to my car and they're like bringing you into their environment okay. and then there's the ones that are like the true classic affair like hey let's meet for dinner my wife's out of town for two weeks let's have dinner a few times and maybe sleep together and see what it's like kind of thing like pretending essentially you're you're the true side piece then there's the hey i'm on my way to the cvs i got five minutes let's you know bend me over the child seat in the back and fuck me kind of guy there's that (laughs) sort of thing there's 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 these different levels of 
and then they seem to get desperate as they want more of your time or have more time available or something like that where they really are truly living that double life but not committing to anything and then of course there's that fifth one where they are committing to it like oh yeah i'm gonna leave my wife any day now honey it's fine just um you know just be my arm candy or whatever they're doing you know just blow me every day or especially if you happen to work with them or something stupid where they have access to you um it gets messier and much more complicated and the promises get very outrageous (laughs) yeah yeah, there's these differing phases of how those men are willing to interact with their um Mm -hmm. is victims the right word i don't know they're they're us they're they're other other (laughs) other other it's interesting because um for those that i mean i'm sure i've mentioned it um I went to Berea College in Southeastern Kentucky um, for for four years. And there's a lot of, if you like, if you put like a Venn diagram of like married down low people and like um, religious like suppression and like, I forget the one last one. And well, and we're just all out like flaming queens, just as we put them all there and you put like, that's like the center, then you get like that Southeastern Kentucky like, redneck kind of feel vibe for it and yeah. i when i when i was younger <laughs> the i i like the experiences of being with guys that wanted to do things quickly and not necessarily quickly but just like this is all the time i have for let's do it now so that we can do it and be done and go our separate ways and you've got a lot of that yeah there was a limited time frame and a limited commitment. Mm-hmm. So, right. and the intimacy is pretty limited as well, meaning you're not going to spend, you know, delving greatly into anything. It's, um, as we used to say, it's, you know, kind of a, uh, a wham and, and, you know, get the hell out kind of thing. So I think, yeah, it makes sense, David, what you're describing. I think that's part of that spectrum basically that Hadrian was describing of all the different types of individuals and their experiences. <laughs> Some are going to give you time and more intimacy than others. Uh, yeah. To help explain in the, the live chat, um, there was a question from Wolfie about, because we were talking about um, bookstores and because he's abroad and we happen to have an international audience. So in the U S we uh, culturally in our generation, so to speak as uh, co-hosts and with Hadrian as our guests, we refer to adult bookstores. So, um, they are not actually stores that sell books, technically. Uh, well, they used to sell like adult magazines and stuff, but that, that's gone right. the way of the dodo a long time ago. Yeah. So basically, it's an erotica store, uh, for lack of a better definition. So they have toys, all the paraphernalia. Uh, speaking of paraphernalia, some of them sell drug paraphernalia, although with marijuana laws changing across our nation, that I think may also change. Uh, in some ways. So basically when we were younger, uh, that is the place that you know that you could go to pick up a magazine, whether it was a, you know, Playgirl or if it was uh, actually Bear when that came out. Yeah. And as well. And then, you know, with the advent of VHS, that was a whole new scene for people to go out and be able to buy movies uh, in these places, so we usually call them ABS were, or adult bookstores. Yeah, and they were they were they were areas of temptation too, because you, you might go in there for like one video, but they have magazines and they have toys and they have stuff that you know funny things and stuff for mm-hmm. bachelorette parties. And then there's that then there's that back area. Oh, there's a theater uh-huh. over here and there's booths over there, and you yeah. start noticing all these signs and different things. Or they might say real live girls some of them had like little little girl you know booths for girls that would be in with their boobs and everything hanging out there's there was all kinds of range of things it was like a red light district almost uh-huh. yeah and they would and nowadays they're kind of reduced to you know for those of you who are too cowardly go on the internet we still sell dvds um and then there's <laughs> there's all the other bachelorette <laughs> crap they've even gotten more full of over the years because that's what they have to do to stay in business yeah and there, there, there's two types today. I feel for the most part when it comes to adult bookstores, uh, there's the major corporate brands like Adult Mart and Lion King and several other that are Lions across Den. the yeah, Lions Den that are across the nation, and then there's the mom and pop independents. Um, mm-hmm. And I think for the most part, you're going to find, especially in cities or larger uh, areas, not so much rural, that these businesses have been run out of town so they're not really in like the seedy you know bad part of town or that district or whatever 
except for maybe Texas, where I have right. one that's literally up the street. <laughs> well, then. I um, drive past it on my way to and from work. Most of the time there, I've noticed that they've been moved out to the rural areas. Like, they're yeah. on, like, they're a usually outside of city. Highway, they're outside of something. city limits. Yeah. yeah. They're out some in county are, areas. Some are. It all depends. Like, there's, um, in Louisville, there's several in the, like, downtown-ish area. Um, not like here's like the main like buildings and you know corporate buildings or whatever it did like there's a porn store right there it's more of like here's downtown here's kind of like the, the you know areas near downtown but there's still like a few i know i remember there's blue movies if i remember there's one there um if it's still there i don't know um love boutique um and then there is in where i'm from there's a there's a street called Seventh Street, um, and you can it travel. It goes kind of distance, but from downtown till about like where I used to live, which is more southeastern of, of the city, there's a it's pretty much a strip area where there's um, strip clubs and adult bookstores and bars, all yeah. kind of like like in between a flea market, a, a you know a couple of other things here and there, and it's just very interesting. They all kind of either intentionally or unintentionally kind of congregated down the street, mm-hmm. and you can literally. That's go kind of a post World War II city design. Yeah, they wanted they wanted the troublemakers to be in the same zone. So if a policeman had to go down there, mm-hmm. it was just a quick jaunt over to the next one, or they could station one police officer to monitor the whole area. There you go. Yeah, that was that was that was a very post World War II thing, and they they would have little strips like that. In my hometown, it was called Victory Drive, which was right outside the military base because that was where you wanted all the good times to be for the soldiers. And that's where your titty bars <laughs> and your bookstores and your yeah. <laughs> and and cruising is very integral to the download community, even though it's not exclusive. There are some guys who do it the old fashioned way, where they meet you in person and, and develop a relationship that way. But a, a large part of it is guys who cruise. They go to adult bookstores. They go to parks, cottaging. Um, swingers. There's there's a whole range, the whole gamut of things that give men access to sexualities beyond what's supposed to be exclusive with their spouse. Yeah. The thing, if I remember mostly, um, I've heard it mostly in, like, England areas, tea rooms. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I got to, um, I don't, I've seen videos online of like the tea room like if you type tea room and like porn hub and whatnot some don't, some guys in, in in that area are pretty like blazing like they like dicks out like just standing there stroking like and i just i've i'm used to the more kind of discreet kind of you know bathhouse nature no I'm, I'm well, thinking more along. I'm, I'm talking like in a, in the public restrooms. Like, yeah, right. I've I've seen cruising in public restrooms, and then I've seen cruising in tea rooms, and they are very different. Yeah. Cruising in tea rooms is like cruising in a bathhouse. Yeah, like that's right. how extreme it is. Like, like they're so boldened, and I think part of that is our national culture about like this this conceptual puritanical thing that we mm-hmm. supposedly live in, you know, that, that there's so much discretion and, you know, and things aren't just that, you know, in your face, so to speak. And I agree with you, David, like sometimes you'll see a video and you'll be like, I, I have to agree. I'd be the same camp as you. I think where I go, Whoa, I, <laughs> I would not know how to react to that if I was abroad. And I saw that. Cause my first thought is like, is there a candy camera? What, what do we, yeah. <laughs> What's the story like, here with that? Someone, is someone. I mean, I'm assuming someone will probably be watching. But like, it was when. Like, I feel like it's that whole. To me, it's just they're very open. Like they know where they are. They're well known. People go there, and it. It. I'm noticing, as far as I you know, can tell, they're not really getting like all the cops and all the flack. Like it's. Yeah. Fucking, and a lot, a lot of places are totally aware of these kind of environments. They know that's the cruisy place. They know that's the bookstore. And they also understand that, you know, there are studies that show that if you drop an adult bookstore in the middle of a neighborhood, your incidences of domestic abuse, um, child abuse, uh, rape among, you know, the, the guys that are there, uh, the um, what else goes down? Cr- other kinds of crime, too, like robbery and that sort of thing. There's a decrease that occurs. It's not dramatic, but it's, you know, 10 to 15 percent where they see a relief that occurs because of accessibility to, you know, this kind of activity. 
<laughs> As a matter of fact, I, I, I could um, I bet I could do a study that would show that the the decrease in adult bookstores across the United States can be directly connected to the increase of incels. <laughs> mm, interesting topic for a future show, uh, <laughs> incels. So I agree with you, uh, Hadrian, what you're talking about that. Um, one of the things I think that people don't understand about download experiences is that it's a stress release mm -hmm. is typically what's taking place for the individual that is not open, I guess is the right. way to phrase it or wanting certain populations to know their, their business, so to speak. Right. Um, for me, you know, my experiences, I don't have any that really kind of stand out, especially like from the early days, other than it was cruising in a park, which the park was too two blocks, block and a half from an adult bookstore. And at that time, because we're talking pre-internet age or early birth of internet age, we did not have smartphones, let alone really cell phones at that point, uh, as popular as we do today. So you had to go to where the people were and you didn't know who you were going to see, what was going on. Um, I think one of the things that shocked me the most about seeing this and going through the cruising at that point was how there was a, a tribe or there was a tribalism to it that I didn't understand at first. And then it came to my uh, mind, oh, these individuals are here all the time. And that's how they know each other. Like, right. And they gave each other nicknames. They knew whose car was who, who did what. Uh, I found that very interesting, Like, mm -hmm. uh, probably more from a sociological standpoint many years later. But at the time, I was all like, it freaked me out a little bit. Like, it kind of... I, it didn't teach me a lesson, but it was a, I guess, a wake up call. Like, there is not no, as my, much anonymity as you think there is. My first concept of a queen was from cruising zones because I thought they were the queen of the grounds. They were the queen of the the MC, the the matter D. They were the ones who maintained the environment because cottaging is a male space, or not cottaging, but cruising in general, cruisy areas, tea rooms, that sort of thing, are a male space, and they're the ones who collect the rules, so to speak, and non-verbally communicate them to others. Like, oh, in this particular bathroom, we only play in the stalls because it's, it's, it's patrolled occasionally, or this particular one is never patrolled, or the guy that comes by even gets a blowjob himself or just ignores us as long as there's no trouble. So you can actually openly whip your stuff out here in the bathroom. And then there are others that are like, hey, you can even stand outside and chill out there and they won't bother you as long as you're not exposing yourself. So they kind of – they're the ones who set the tone and carry the knowledge forward in a very nonverbal way and get others into it. And they are the queens that cycle in and out and keep each other informed like, oh, so-and-so is here and he went over to that bathroom and got in trouble. They don't want us going over there. So yeah. – that, that was my first concept of a queen is because they were the ruler of that environment. I don't know if that was, I don't think that's accurate, but it was a great way to help me understand the cruising environment very quickly. Well, you bring up a good point, Hadrian. I think that happens in a lot of places. It's just mm -hmm. how integral you are. I think that, that it's no different to see within a, a hidden community, what you see in a greater community, this hierarchy, this concept of who leads or who kind of oversees, um, I know in some circles, more so outside of like cruising, but like with um, within the gay community, the drag community, another thing you might hear someone referred to as mother, um, you know, which is a, a person who has a maternal instinct probably and is out looking out for other people, but also it's probably wise in some ways. Uh, you know, dad or daddy has also been used that in that way as well. It's interesting you say that because I hadn't thought about that in a long time. And I'm like, yeah, you kind of got a feel in the early days, especially with my DL experiences in the cruising aspect that there was there was now we call them thirsty or whatever the new languages the kids use these days like they are super desperate so their behavior is like sort of erratic and uncomfortable mm -hmm. and very um personally possessive like this is the bitch that will like she'll cut you at the Achilles tendon to get the dick if she has to like if it's just right really horribly cutthroat and then there are others that are very relaxed and and they actually would you know would be like go ahead like hand gesture or head nod or anything right. to like you know this one's yours or i understand you know this is kind of a roulette right. situation there are definitely some queens who think that oh you can't be in this environment unless i get you first they're, they're like they're, they kind of moved into a matron almost like hey there, there are some that are like that. I've been in those environments where I felt like, Ugh, I'm going to have to play with you if I'm going to get anywhere because I need you to leave me alone kind of thing. And then they're, you're right. Then they're the queens that are like, you know, everybody do what they need. You know, they're benevolent queens. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I, so yeah, I totally. Yeah, they're definitely right. There are those that just try to take over the environment and and mm -hmm. say that they're they're the ones who are getting everything first. Well, I, there's probably a, a deeper thing going on psychologically about whether they they think that it's a finite availability versus mm -hmm. opportunity. Like I think those that maybe recognize that another dick will come along. No offense. Uh, are what's that, David? I said someday my dick will come. Uh, oh. <laughs> There's our second Disney reference of the day accidentally. Um, so, no, I agree that, that yeah, they, they probably see it as, you know, it's either like, I think it's going to be rudimentary to say whether it's half full or half empty. But, you know, yeah. that concept of the, the glass or the cup. But in this case, you know, if you're out and you have a finite window and a limited opportunity, that's probably where these behaviors come from that you're going right. to act in, in such a way. And I've seen both of it. And I know I've actually been both of it. Like there have been times where it's like, I ain't got time. So I'm going to be more, and I don't want to say ruthless, but more uh, focused. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and that, and that works on both sides. If there's, there's the Queens that, you know, rule the environment. Then there's the guys who go into that environment who have decided that, Hey, cruising is great and all, but there's a risk involved, especially as over the 80s and 90s, the police, you know, ever since Mansfield, Ohio, things have gotten more militant towards cruising, of course. But you've got you've got people who don't want to go in that environment because it's too risky. They've seen someone they know it's a small enough, you know, like my hometown of Columbus. I think guys ran into each other all the time who knew each other and tried to, you know, OK, we're both in the same bucket together who don't want that kind of risk. Because if one of those guys gets caught, then, and you know that person, it becomes questionable and you just don't need yeah. that kind of question. Yeah. Maybe your wife is getting curious. Maybe there's um, apps on your phone that are a risk. There's all kinds of reasons that guys decide, I need to go from a cruising situation into a download situation, which is a little more formal. It requires a certain level of personal um, yeah. acceptance as well. Guys don't just go from never having thought about a guy before to suddenly having a, a down low, you know, on the side piece, they go, they have to go through this whole cycle of coming out to themselves and figuring out what they want sexually or emotionally, or is it just sex they want? Do they just want to stick a dick in their ass or do they want to actually develop a, a real friendship with people? And some of these guys have some really complicated fantasies. Like I had a guy who lived in Duluth, Georgia, and he had this really crazy fantasy that I was going to find a girlfriend. He would find a girlfriend. The girlfriends would be best friends. We would live in a house next to each other in the trailer park, and we would be best friends, married to our wives, having kids, but fucking each other on the side. I'm like, that's a really long con. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, uh, Two women, not just one, two women you want to fool into marrying us so that we can fuck on the side and not be judged for it. Really? I mean, that, wow. that's some... Find two lesbians, you'll be fine. That's oh, like Lord. some... Next level, that's worse. Like, broke back mountain stuff. I mean, yeah. right, exactly. And there are some guys who have fantasies like that because they want, they are so desperate to keep the sheen they've put together of being straight. And granted, being gay for them may be like 15% of their life. It's not even gay. They're bisexual, they're pansexual. They are whatever they are to define that parts of themselves. And just because they've gotten married, who says they can't feed that 15% every now and then and figuring out what resources they want to put for it? Some of them, it's cruising a bathhouse every now and then, getting their dick sucked, and they go home and it's gone. Others, yeah. they need someone more permanent with them, or they're concerned yeah. about STDs or getting caught. But if they can find someone that can be down low with them, the word said a true affair. And even yeah. if it happens once every three months, they have gotten out of the cruising environment, they've shed all the risk, and they've concentrated the risk to one individual. Yep. Or well, a few individuals that they have a few different play buddies. There's all yeah. kinds of situations where guys have decided that this this down low situation is better than cruising. And, and they I, live they live parallel. Yeah. And I, I think a lot I've encountered that often. You know, you, you meet the guys that especially like online, a lot of times for me I was online, you meet the guys that want that release, but they don't necessarily want it with multiple people they don't want they don't trust the whole like they they're mm -hmm. scared either you know, stds or whatever they want like one or two maybe a few people that they can kind of to be frank monitor in a or sense maybe even right. reliable yeah right like, like oh like, i know this person I, I know this a frequency i can get off with i like getting off with them so yeah let's just stick with yeah. that it, it it reduces having to worry about there or what have it, you it, and yeah it mitigates really, a lot of risk yeah you 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 also know that they're they're usually available when you're available 
like you kind of find out, oh, like I'm going to be available like Sunday nights at three or Sunday night three, Sunday nights at six. And they happen to always be online around that time. So I know they're pro- maybe they're available. So that's who I'm going to hit up with the most. And I kind of, you know, and you kind of build a almost, I don't want to say rapport, but you build a relationship together in a sense with, right. um, and you have no, not necessarily no fear, but you have your fears are are limited or lessened because of you you've been with them a few times. You know their routine. You know what they want. You they know what you want, and you can potentially and, get it get it in and out in like twenty minutes if necessary, kind of thing. And you can tell a lot about a guy who's on the down low by the type of lover they choose. If they choose someone who is gay and out, they are they might be exploring that life vicariously through someone else they might they might be saying hey it's 15 percent now but maybe i want it to be 20 percent. maybe i want to experience more maybe they have a party lifestyle that i'll never get to experience so maybe they'll be able to get a week and go to a bear event or p-town or something like that and blow some steam off in a bigger way but then they really are dedicated to their wife and family and they want to go back to that uh, mm-hmm. or maybe they're thinking hey the kids are about to turn 18. Me and the wife have been, you know, haven't had sex in several years. We're just waiting for that moment to get divorced and move on from our lives or separate or whatever they want to do. Then there are other guys who are like, I want another guy who's married like me, who lives in the same neighborhood, even who works a nine to five like me, who's in the same job and knows that this has a definite end of some time. We're, go- we're both in five years. We're going to be too old for this and we'll move on. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's a relief of a latent thing. Sometimes it's reliving something they had when, you know, they were a teenager. Maybe they had a boyfriend when they were in high school and they were in college and then they decided I'm getting married to a woman. Um, there's a lot of different reasons that people will structure um, a different person into their down low lifestyle, whether it be mm-hmm. someone like them that they can let go or even someone they can use. And some of them, it's totally abusive. They want some kid that they can lavish with gifts and money. And it really is a power thing. Like, it's, it's almost like they're a prostitute and I'm just going to overwhelm you with everything that I am. And then when I'm done with you, we'll move, I'll move on. The fair exchange yeah. was you got a, you got a, you got something nice. You got a nice dinner, but I got dick, you know, it's, it's a transactional affair. So you can, you can really tell a lot about down low guys by the type of lover they take and what it seems like their goals are and trying to divine that. Yeah. Okay. In the, Live chat, Hadrian, there was a question asked. A dog I wanted to know, what was the Mansfield, Ohio reference? Oh, this Mansfield, not- Ohio. Sorry about that. So okay. uh, back, back in the 1950s, there was a little town called Mansfield, Ohio, that had a problem. Um, and their problem was they had a, a bathroom that was kind of underground. It was like one of those European style where it's two stairs that go down to the bathrooms. And it was very isolated. It was very small. And it was very cruisy. And they had a lot of guys that were going there and having sex, and they couldn't figure out what to do about it. But at the same time, kind of unrelated, there was a guy who murdered two little girls in a park. And he was, he was very unstable. He had a lot of other mental problems. But they really focused on the fact that he admitted that he had homosexual contact at this particular bathroom. And for some reason, they thought, oh, cruisers? Those people are psycho. It was never, they never bothered to really think, okay, this guy was just psycho and he was just getting his dick sucked. No, he was, he was, this man was psycho. Therefore, all cruisers are psycho. They're all potential child murderers, rapists, that sort of thing. And back then, what they used to do with people who molested children or were or caught having sex, anyone who was queer or um, any, in any range of those weird sexualities where it was just something that wasn't done in polite society back then, what they thought, they would say, you need to leave town. They wouldn't arrest you and put you in prison. They would say, move on somewhere. They put you in a penitentiary for six months to, to treat you and then let you go. Well, Mansfield, Ohio had this very different idea. So cameras were new. So they had a two-way mirror. They, they built a two-way mirror into a door and they had cops sit back there with a camera and record the whole thing. Like these were old school. There was no audio. So they recorded these men having sex in this bathroom. And then when the men would leave, Somebody would watch them. They would radio ahead. They'd watch the person leave, get in their car, and then they'd radio the the license plate number, and then a cop would pull them over. And they went ham. They went really hardcore on these men. Like some 60, I think it's 50 or 60 men, if I'm not mistaken, ended up going to prison 
because and these were like men who were married these are professors some of these men were terrible people and they really needed to be caught but they really went ham on just because they were having sex in a bathroom um and it is it, in they eventually some of the sentences got lessened and that sort of thing but it really was a big earth shaker and it taught and they made a they produced a video and you can look it up you can look it up it's called um tea room is the name of the movie about it and you can also look up mansfield ohio uh tea room and you will see the video where they recorded these men having sex it's it's some of it's kind of hot just by the way but some of it is also <laughs> but some of it it's also all of it is very oh. sad because these men were just trying to engage in an activity that otherwise society was trying to prosecute them for and um it taught a lot and, and that that film actually made the rounds throughout all the police departments in the united states a lot of them at least where it taught them how they can set up sting operations to catch the queer element in their environment because if you catch the queers you catch the commies and that was the way it was in the 1950s i think i have this video yeah, I'm it's pretty. It's pretty powerful me. stuff, and it's kind of sad. Like, there's a link. I'm sharing. Oh yeah, I'm sharing it to the um, um, our chat, um, Skype chat. But I have. But it's it's an ex ham. It's ex hamster. It's a, it's, it's a porn. But I you think got it's the I dirty think one. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For for our uh, listening and viewing audience, when this episode posts on our website, uh, we'll put in links. I found two links. One is um, a reference to the Mansfield, Ohio restroom sting. Uh, and then I also found what Hadrian was just mentioning. It's called Tea Room, a document presented by William E. Jones, which is the documentary, I think, from back in 2008, I think, is when uh, it was released. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I... I had to think about what you were mentioning, Adrian, and then I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I learned about this. Honestly, I'm going to own it. It was either on XTube or Pornhub. Like, yeah. I didn't really catch it in, like, the the major media stuff that this film comes out and basically is showing this sting operation. And not so much right. the sting itself, but, like, them filming men unbeknownst to them, like, you know, hooking up in, right. a, in a public park in a, in a restroom there. Yeah. And then these men, these men were like married with kids and family men. All they want to do was get their dick sucked. And I'm not saying that cruising is not illegal. I'm not saying that there aren't, that cruising isn't a problem and it isn't something that we as a community need to mature from. Um, but we need to be able to create our own LGBT environments where we can, you know, engage in our, with ourselves in a way that is uh, culturally relevant. I hate to say that cruising is an actual cultural element of the gay community, but I do believe it is. And um, and indeed, we shouldn't be playing around in parks and we should be able to have our own environments like adult bookstores or gay bathhouses or something like that. And um, it needs to be an environment that men can explore uh, safe and in a way that can be they can be educated. You know, I loved bathhouses because you go in there and they're like, here's your condom. Here's your lube. There's the showers. And, you know, you, you feel like you are you feel like you're being chaperoned through an experience. And with us, with an eye to safety, instead of being, instead of everybody just ignoring, like we don't know what goes on back there, we don't watch, yeah. we don't know what that stuff is around that hole in the wall. Um, your yeah. risk is yours because uh -huh. it's a highly risky environment. It is, um, and you know, a lot of DL from, I mean, not DL for me, but experiences I've noticed and seen and encountered, oftentimes are these people who find out about, oh, you can go to that bar. And and you can get your dick sucked if you if you you know just go to the dark area and just kind of stand there for a while. You probably that'll happen. I've um, unfortunately the bar's closed, but there was a bar here in town called Serpent that had a known element of DL like play period play periods play time. You know, and um, like most bars, they turned a blind eye to it, except for when they got raided, and then. That's when things got like real for a couple months, and then it kind of went away, you know. After a while, but it was just very—it's very interesting to me that there are people that you you find out about it just just through like you can chat, you can find. Um, well, Squirt is a great example of like it actually has cruising listings um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, so people know where these places are, and people do frequent them on occasion. And it is risky. I'm honestly. <sighs> surprised and saddened that oftentimes the cruisiest places are like um store bathrooms like macy's and yeah and 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 yeah i think there's i think there's a there's a time and opportunity element 
as yeah. well. I mean, Hadrian's bringing up an, an excellent point from a, a cultural aspect that the reason that these things existed or created or evolved, whatever you want to say, was because society wise, like there was, a, you know, negative effects to open like, you know, public displays of affection or trying to meet other individuals. So we either created our own spaces or modified existing spaces to those. I find it interesting, Damon, you're talking about like at the bar that there was a notable kind of element to some of the patronage and that there was sort of a space to it. And they were, you know, they, I don't know if I want to say they were fine or complicit, but like you said, they were, you know, until they got raided. And a lot of these, you know, things are that way. Like uh, adult bookstores have been that way. Bars have been that way, you know, where clubs or whatever, you know, it's like they didn't care about the patronage until, you know, someone decided that they wanted to, you know, go round up, you know, the bad element, so to speak. I, and, and that acts, and the act swings both ways. A lot of people don't realize how oppressive. Straight people could be, and I, I, I say straight people in the broadest sense. I do mean police specifically. How very brutal police could be to gay, the, the to gay elements in their neighborhoods. For example, San Francisco, the freaking, you know, gay beacon of hope and and light in our universe. Um, once upon a time was super oppressive, and it took gays almost full on rioting and uprising against them to get anything changed. Oh, there's a bar there called Twin Peaks, and it's the oldest gay bar in, in San Francisco, I believe. And the way it was designed back in the 1940s and 50s was um, men could not talk and leave together. That's how oppressive, that's what the cops were looking for. Oh, you guys are homosexuals. We're going to arrest you because you guys are leaving together. The slightest element of any kind of contact was grounds for arrest. So what Twin Peaks did was behind the bar, they installed mirrors so that guys could sit at the bar, not talk to each other, make eye contact, cruise through eye contact, and then leave together separately and connect somewhere else in another part of the neighborhood away from the police oh. watching. So it was, people think that level of oppression doesn't exist. It did exist. And that's the reason. And cruising is a direct response to that. And down low is an extension from it as well. But men have been having affairs with men long before, you know, well, probably parallel to cruising for a very long time because they want to mitigate their risk in different ways. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there's, I think there's influences on, the way a society behaves or how we interpret those things based on how individuals feel about the openness of sex and mm -hmm. sexuality and those aspects. Historically, there have been cultures that are long gone that were very open, you know, and, and people look at them maybe a little bit with reverence about the fact that everything was just, it, nobody kind of questioned anything else. I mean, there were probably some boundaries, uh, but otherwise people didn't necessarily care. And so we find in living in our society generationally that things, you know, changed. I found it interesting when I was in college that there was a time in American society that nobody gave a shit if you were gay, but that's yeah. because gay as a term didn't exist and neither did homosexuality. Mm -hmm. It was just two individuals of the same gender that lived together or, you know, whatever. Engaging in immoral was. behavior. Well, it was pre that, like be before the, you know, the, oh, I see. Yeah. The 20th century concepts that came around that was, you know, um, putting a lot of structure into things or rules or whatever you want to call it. I found that fascinating. We lived as a, as a culture that it was like, yeah, so what? Like, it's not that big a deal. Like, um, I was just watching the most recent Will and Grace and Jack does this whole thing as a character about Gabraham Lincoln. It, he doesn't say it that way, but it's known historically that Abraham Lincoln as a president of the United States had one or maybe more than one close male friends. And there's been a lot of speculation and some evidence. I say evidence with air quotes because I haven't seen it. That shows that he had intimate relations with other men. And so he does this whole like little musical thing. But that's a part of what I think people don't understand is if he was a man who, you know, got intimate with other men at that time, things were different than they are now. Mm -hmm. And so like to, to use those terms and those labels is not the same thing. In fact, it's right. interesting because I'm like, yeah, they wouldn't even call it the DL or the download back then. Right. A lot of people don't know that homosexual is a word that's only been invented in the last hundred years or so. Bisexual, you know, that's what I mean. even gay as a term is fairly new. You were just, you were queer. You were, you know, something different. Yeah. And I think a lot of that culture ends up affecting individuals and how they behave I, I take point in a positive way or um hadrian what you said about how a bathhouse provides you with a 
I guess, an open educative opportunity to be with individuals and not necessarily have it be the same kind of stigma or risk, really, in, right. in other ways. But it's it's everything has its pros and cons. I mean, I even agree, like, right. in the live chat, Drew had made the comment about, you know, except for the attitude of clicks that are there re- referencing inside, like, a bathhouse. To me, though, that's more evocative of just broader culture. Yeah. Well, the, and, and people are just but, unhappy, so they they coalesce and they and in some ways it's weird it's kind of like um a distilling factor like when you see people in those environments i don't want to say it's their true nature but they it gets amped up so while they may seem pleasant in public they're not pleasant in private right yeah yeah and, and and sometimes that gets taken too far too you know i talk you know i talk about the concept of an environment you create and it starts with i'm going to play with myself and think about a man and then it goes to, I'm going to do it in this bathroom stall. I'm going to do it in this bathroom. I'm going to do it in this park. People, men, as more men join a movement of cruising and become, and you get down low spinoffs and that sort of thing, the environment grows and you eventually end up with something like a society that is doing it too. And I mean, like, 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 you know, the, the rumors about the Illuminati or the Freemasons or Boy Scouts or whatever it is, you end up with this environment of, homosexuality or even not even homosexual you know homosexual element inside that helps bond men together and they say i can be free and who i want to be in this environment but i, I society wise because we're all we're all together and we're all protecting our secret as where we are married and have men and that's right and or women and children or, i'm sorry children that's the word i'm looking for we have <laughs> wives and children and uh they create you know th- that's why some of these um some men's clubs turn into this uh, almost like militant homosexual environment where they they yeah. hard they hardcore protect themselves and they don't want a woman element. That's why I think a lot of uh, movements to keep women out of certain things like certain sports, certain golf clubs, uh, secret societies, or you know you know think tanks, whatever men want to call themselves when they get together and and vaguely talk about. Uh, environmental policy, but have sex during the after party. Um, those kind of <laughs> things, um, they, 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 they turn into a different thing where that's not what we today would call the LGBT community as far as being pro-woman and pro-choice and you know pro-civil rights and pro-people of color and that sort of thing where it's a, we are white men protecting our little party because we don't want people to know that we're all fucking each other. Lovely. Well, there was a whole lot of tea spilled on the nation's capital. Um, <laughs> I caught all that. Delicious to me. <laughs> it's piping right. hot. Um, but... Scalding, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> scalding. But I, I mean, I, I think you bring up a good point. I mean, I, what I find interesting about... <laughs> I love that. I love that fan so much. <laughs> well, wait, we have it in black and white, too. So, you know... <laughs> How do you not have <laughs> one, Adrian? I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to. I don't have it. So, Uh-oh. Christmas yeah. gift for uh, Adrian. It's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to warn you, though. You best be careful because I don't want you to become one of those clackety, you know, faggities, you know, that. <laughs> oh Lord! <laughs> Drop the f bomb up in here. So, on a, on a quick side note, so we were talking about how how uh, homosexual and gay uh, is just started like within the last hundred years so Mm -hmm. i actually went to dictionary.com to figure out the the old usage and it used to be merry lively bright and showy but in Mm -hmm. the 1930s is when it started becoming um in use for homosexual which you could say that nowadays the stereotype for homosexual is merry lively bright and showy there there's some there's some um ownership that's one of the things that i think people struggle with is stereotype is based in some reality or some truth and there's concepts that a community will own the use of a word or a label or whichever so i think yes it's it's challenging to look at the the vocabulary (laughs) and say what applies what doesn't apply who what where when um yeah so what I find interesting um, in terms of the down low experiences is did any of us know what it was that we were doing when we were doing it? 
Like, was anyone consciously thinking uh, through about this is probably not correct? And I don't mean correct, like, morally, I think that you recognize that there was an impact. Like, Damon, you had said that you picked up on, like, you, you like your antenna were up, so to speak, you know, um, in a kind of a sixth sense way. And then the confirmation, it sounds like, was when he picked you up in the car and then you saw the car seat. It was kind of like, oh, that's a thing that was not... Yeah necessarily known yeah. before well, and for, a, for me go ahead jeff i had an experience where, where it was, I, I never really thought about anybody being down low that i was ever with it's just i went had sex with somebody who left so mm -hmm. um but uh, one time i went over to a guy's house uh in the middle of the night uh we met like on his side door and we went out to the garage where we saw where we fucked mm-hmm <laughs> So wow. you know, either Which is... it's just he was trying to be polite to his roommates <laughs> or, or his, his female roommate who he happened to have gone through a commitment ceremony, possibly in a house of worship. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't see any evidence of any children or a ring yeah, or anything, it, it, but it's I was also be... young, dumb, full of cum. And... Yeah. It's right. going to always be a, a situation where Sometimes you will know. Like sometimes you'll know. Like like the I'll, I'll own the internet is is a wonderful and almost sometimes not so wonderful place. You can keep as much detail to, about yourself. You can only put so much out there. You can put like I'm just looking for dick, which you know sometimes they are. DL guy is looking to get their dick sucked or get sucked or fucked or get fucked. You know, and and they can put that all out there. And and sometimes I mean they don't always have to, but some do. And then you connect and maybe you get a feeling of, of for me, my usual feeling it w happens when they're overly protective, if that makes sense. Like they don't necessarily want to do certain things because there's a potential risk factor involved or they're very like hesitant to do things or move past certain things, or don't say they want to do things, and then they don't do anything at all. Um, and it, 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 it there's, I, I'm not saying I always get that feeling, but I do usually get the sensation, usually when someone is in that kind of mode, that there may be some, they're either hiding something or there's something that they're not trying to disclose. Right. I agree with you, Damon. I think that you can pick up, at least I can, maybe not everyone uh, is, but it sounds like all four of us are in agreement. Like, you... If you open your mind, if you pay attention, the details are there or maybe the details are not there. And that's kind of the clue that this individual is not maybe living a 100% authentic open life. I mean, yeah. probably nobody is. But the yeah. reality is that they're not saying certain things. I mean, they're, yeah, there's classic signs like whether or not they have a wedding band, you know, a, a ring. And even or, that gets fuzzy nowadays because men can, guys can get married or well, LGBT right, can get I married. Mean, this is this isn't a criticism of marriage equality, but I will agree with you, Hadrian. It really kind of fucks with the mind when you see a man and he's hot and he's wearing a band, and you're like, okay, so is it just for show? Are you married? Uh, married to a woman? Married to a man? To a like, man? How, oh, yeah, <laughs> like you know, do you have an open relationship? Like, it's kind of funny, like how more equality just makes things more complex because it's it more difficult. Like, to, to not really care about that. <laughs> I mean, no, not necessarily. I don't think it's a bad thing. So my usual feeling about it all is they're not, they, I hate saying it, but depending on the status of their relationship, if they're violating rules of their relationship, they are the one that are violating rules of their relationship. Well, you bring up an interesting point, David, about being the other, yeah. whatever, fill in the blank, like other man, other woman, other, you know, person. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's different philosophies on this. And I think yeah. one that you're presenting is like, I am only responsible for my actions. So don't come for me. Don't call me a home wrecker and say that I ruined marriages and families and uh -oh. that kind of stuff because I'm you, not you, the one that is, you know, stepping out. Hey, Adrian. <laughs> so I have very complicated feelings about it as, as I haven't really talked about any of my experiences, but I've had a lot of affairs with men that were married in, in Atlanta, um, I, I had an affair with an, uh, an assembly of God minister for multiple years. Um, I've been the other woman. 
and um, I've been caught. <laughs> I've I've had some really complicated shit. I've I've gone that I've gone steps beyond the cruising element, and I'm like, I'll blow you at the at the bookstore once a week or something like that. Into, hey, let's meet for dinner since your wife's out of town, or you know, traffic's really bad. Stop by my place and I'll blow you real quick. I've I've gone to that next element and been the regular boy on call for 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 a few guys. And um, my thought pattern once upon a time was that I can't get married. I'm boyfriends is as good as it gets. Living together is as good as it gets. At least, and, and these are some really quality men that women have cornered the market on. And I also, I've, also, I've often felt like a victim of circumstance a little bit because a lot of these men that I met in the late 90s and early 2000s were men that were ex- actively exploring their sexuality in the 70s and 80s. And something scared them off. Like something said to them, hey, maybe we don't understand everything we're doing. And if you want to thrive, you need to probably stick to the straight path, so to speak, versus mm. exploring men anymore. And that thing was HIV. A right. lot of men that I knew in the late 90s were coming back around to it since they understood how HIV was transmitted, how to protect themselves, and Truvada has blown the doors off that completely. But, uh-huh. but these were men that, were, that had a choice of bisexuality. Uh, you know, maybe they maybe they were lucky enough to have or feel like they could force themselves into some, you know, some sort of life that they were supposed to live. And they did because HIV is fucking scary and people were dying. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so I've, I felt like, well, you know, these men are coming back around. They need someone to help them, too. I mean, what are they I mean, what are they going to go to the bookstore and get the dick sucked and possibly, you know, get an STD and take it home to the wives? You can justify it in a bunch of different ways. And then I said, but I'm their regular thing and they only want to call me up or me and a few other guys. And it's more isolated. It's controlled. It's something, you know, I, I, I talk about mitigating risk a lot. And they really are. Yeah. And I'm part of that solution. And it's not like I can go anywhere anyway. It's all I'm going to do is be able to have a boyfriend. I mean, I might as well enjoy them and them enjoy me because they are really hot men and they're good quality men. These women have, have managed to score. Good for them. Let me <laughs> let me get a taste of that cake, maybe. So, um, but in, in, in an age of same-sex marriage, and I'm on a soapbox. I'm sorry, guys. Give me a minute. Um, okay. um, I feel like that's no longer the case. That we have enough education. We the mature the the community's been mature enough. The, the LGBT community stands well on its own, and um, these women are no longer my rivals, so to speak. I'm not doing their husbands a favor. I am damaging their relationship. These women are no longer oh her, you know, the woman who can get married that I can't. I now have, I can now get married too. I have the same rights as her. She's my sister and I'm sleeping with her man. It's, it's a solidarity with the women, not of service to the men. Does that make sense? That the tone has yeah. changed. The zeitgeist has moved where these men, yeah, they, they still have a right to explore that 10% and they're curious about things, but at what cost? Well, agree. But that cost is, but Hadrian, that cost has always been there. Oh, so totally. I, Absolutely. I get, it is. I get where like your viewpoint has changed and you're going mm-hmm. from, like they were the enemy to now they are my family. Like right, and I'm totally going from a twenty a horny twenty year old to a pious forty year old. Totally making that switch. But here's the thing, that's that's a you change. Uh huh. That's not a they change. They oh, no. have, have not changed necessarily. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't. I don't. I think the situation well, and, that impacts them is different because, I mean, HIV isn't as much of a threat anymore. At least it's a controlled threat. It's an understandable thing. The technology has changed tremendously. The societal maturity of the lgbt community it's no longer like oh i might as well give that you know let that gay guy blow me it's not like he can get married now it's like no no now you're teasing me with something i can yeah. actually achieve and what i mm. was going on with, with my rules in regards to relationships is my feelings usually is that every really like every person's relationship is different i know hell in my chorus there is a bisexual man who is married to a woman and they they pretty much have established like certain rules where he can go off and play with the guy and have no, there's no problems on her end. There's no problems on his end. That's what I'm thinking of. But if I'm encountering a man online, I don't necessarily know our, I don't necessarily know those rules unless they tell me. So I can't, you know, you can't define that. So you might as well let them take the responsibility. Yeah. That's where I'm Absolutely. You're, you're right. I can agree with that. I fully yeah. can agree with that. You're right. And then maybe I'm being a little bit narrow and I'm expecting men to be of their worst natures. Yeah. Well, I'm expecting I, men to be there in a cheating situation because I don't know I, as many women that would say, yeah, honey, go to the bookstore, blow some dick through a glory hole. 
I would agree that there's probably not very many of them, but I wouldn't mind meeting them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> here's 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 the thing that um, that really comes across for me is, Hadrian, you're being really really methodical and and intelligent and kind of at a certain level when in what you're saying, and I'm like. But in a bathroom, in a park, in a car, like the 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 level of thinking, like the cerebral effort is very different. And I think that's the complexity of, of sexuality, especially but, between like to if you not that there is, but if you want to view things from kind of like a a binary concept of men versus women, which I know is not fair. But as an example to say that we operate very differently, very hormonally differently. So it makes sense to me that people engage in, you know, seven minutes of heaven, you know, circumstances, and they don't go through their CV or their resume or fill out right. an application or any of that kind of shit. Like whether it be verbal, mental, or all of it, it's just like, it's a wham and a bam. And then, you know, the same and ones maybe, over and man. everybody moves on. And maybe I'm blurring the lines too much, and maybe we need to create some sort of separation here, is that that's cruising, as where down low is something else. Down low is when they've invited you into their environment and their lives. You right. aren't just a stop for on the way home from work. You are the stop on the way home from work. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. It does. I think So that's... you're right. You're right. I totally put a lot of that way when it comes to bathhouses and bookstores. I'm like, you're here. We're in this male environment. You know what you came here for versus a man who's contacted me online. Like, hey, I, I wouldn't mind hooking up with someone regularly after after, you know, after work. And like, like, that's DL. That we're, we're getting into a different level of complexity and admission on your part of how much you're, you're inviting me in. Want to fuck me before I go to work. Right. I've had that. So. To help explain a little bit further, Hadrian, would you be fair to say that there's a regularity to, to DL as opposed to cruising? Yes. And there's probably a different level of maturity on the behalf of any man who's engaging in that as well, where they've gone beyond the, uh, I just want to get my dick suck or suck a dick or whatever. They just want the physical contact and there's something along the lines of, I need more. Like I, I want to either have better sex because I know the person better, or I want to know some, I want to have an emotional connection or I want a friend. That yeah. happens to enjoy dick like I do too, so that can learn something different. It's yeah. there's all different ways that people try to expand their mind and expand yeah. their capabilities, and you know, growing from a purely physical relief or exploration into an interpersonal uh, yeah. exploration is is a different a different item, I think. Yeah, I've had the experiences of of men who married and DL and what have you that are exploring their sexuality and their, their um, kinks in a sense. Right. I have a guy that has found out that he really fucking loves to be spanked and paddled through just inter our interactions. And he not requested every time, but you know, like when we've played, that's usually a part of what we do. And he likes it. He likes being submissive. He wants to be the sub. And um, maybe that's where he's, you know, this is where he's getting it, where in his traditional married life, he has to be the the, the man of the house and the, the breadwinner mm -hmm. and the this and that. And where instead, when he's with another man, he can submit. Right. He doesn't have right. to. Gender roles. And that's. And that's a very different thing than than you know when I was talking about a man who's cheating. And I, I, I do and I do want to say that it's it's impressive that a man will say, "Hey, I've made a marital commitment to my wife, and I'm raising children." But why can't I? Because people people change over years; yeah, they really yeah. do, and they explore new things, they discover new things about themselves. I mean, I'm constantly figuring out new things that I just didn't know I ever wanted to be into, and. It's, it can be dawning. It can be really earth shattering because you've made all these statements about your life up to that point. You're like, well, some of those aren't true now. What are you going to do? Hold to it because your 25 year old self made some stupid decision. Or are you going to say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to experience something new and expand, expand my sexual pleasure or my, you know, my mental facility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it, it really, it can be a choice on the behalf of the person who's being asked, like, is this something I really want to help this dude with? Or is that, is this a complication I want to accept? Uh, and I'm, I'm willing to accept all the limits that he's willing to place on this type of friendship or relationship. And it can be, it can be, it can be rewarding because uh, I've certainly done it and it can be earth shattering if things go awry. And I've certainly experienced that too, where 
it just comes a part of the scene and you have to face all the consequences of all the lies and the, and the sneaking around you've done, or did you help this man discover something new? And it's something you took back to his wife. And now they have a rock out sexual relationship because you helped him think of something new. It, yeah. it's, it really is like a mentoring situation. It's, it's like a job almost, you know, who's, who's really benefiting from this encounter. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's a, there's a certain level of engagement that's happening. Um, by everybody that's involved. And I think that it's an important distinction. Like we were talking about the, the shortness versus the length that goes into things and the frequency and to the level of commitment. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm curious though, Adrian, if you think there's much of a difference between DLs and like fuck buddies. Uh, They're in the same realm. I think, I mean, DL has always been kind of a blanket term. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I, I heard it. I'd always called it called affair. I'd always heard it called that. I didn't know. I didn't, I never heard the term DL until I heard it from the black community in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would always been, you know, an affair, a man who has affair with men, that sort of thing, or, you know, in a gay affair. And, um, but you know, it's just a different term on the same thing, but I always thought, I always thought DL was a little more ubiquitous as a as a, as a cultural thing in Atlanta, because it was men that were having a lot of sex with men in crossing up their cruising and their affairs at the same time. It was a little more, a little more active and a little more rampant is the word I would, I think could be used. Yeah. Did I make, does that sound right? It was, it was something, it was happening so much that, you know, even the wives are starting to notice like, why do you keep disappearing yeah. to the bathroom when someone walks by? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, there's I think there's um a lot of things that have happened over the the course of culture and history of time, you know, from like you talked about Hadrian the Mansfield uh Ohio situation to where we are today that we've created spaces, we've done things, but we still have this society that I think creates it and it manifests it only because we struggle with this openness concept of just accepting right. people however they are and it doesn't work. I had kind of had the question, um, and I don't want to really get involved because we're starting to wrap up about, do we think that this this concept or this existence comes from our culture of shame about sex and honesty? Yeah. I, th- I I asked the question knowing that perhaps all of us are going to agree on, on the same viewpoint of the answer, and that is Yes. Like if we if we lived more in a utopian concept, nobody would give a shit about who does what with who, where, when, and it wouldn't we wouldn't have a need for this label, let alone behaviorally people being on the side, so to speak, or uh, secret, I guess. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So. I don't know if there's ever really an answer to this next kind of idea. Will it ever go away? No. Or, come, me, or, or stop or, or, or not no. happen as much? If it, if it ever does, it's going to be like 5,000 years in the future. Like <laughs> I don't, it's going to be some ridiculous <laughs> amount of time just because I, I think a lot of it um, uh, has to do, do with like all of the traditions and philosophies from uh, religion and just the, the current mindset be, just being transferred down to for, for generations about uh, like uh, we were talking in the chat about polyamory where mm-hmm. and getting into that transition where you're married to your wife you've been totally fine but then you get to a point where uh, you want to have some sex with the man for a, a well, while you know but you don't you still love your wife and everything is just fine, but you just want to have this separate release or there is an attraction because of your spectrum that you're on that, that between the homosexual heterosexual, you're leaning a little bit towards by or something. And you just want to have that additional thing, but then it totally throws away. I never knew you well, felt this way. And it kind of breaks down borders and everything. So everybody well, would have to know that like, right at the beginning and bring it all up front before anything happens. And mm. and I want to be clear, you know, we were talking about definitions of what down low is and definitely down low stops being down low. Once you have consent from your partner, once a man sure. says to his wife, Hey, I'm going to have sex with the guys on the side. And she's like, cool, bro. Just yeah. wear a condom or whatever she's saying. Yeah. That's not down low anymore. Sure. That's, that's, 
yeah, that's open. That's a swinger with a situation, whatever that is, whatever they, however they want to define it. That's not down low is definitely um, it's cornerstone is they are on the low from who they're supposed to be down with. Yeah. <laughs> so to speak, they are, yeah. they are, they are definitely in the, in the shadows of yeah. what is that's acceptable in their current relationship. Yeah. Right. It's, it's still an affair. A lot of people, it's an affair. It's, you know, it's not necessarily, it may start as exploring. It may start as, as something, but reality is down, down low is essentially you are not out about what you're right. doing. To, you're not in the light. To your, yeah. To your, to your significant other. And I know we've talked, and I'm going to really briefly mention this while there is down low, with with women, we've talked about married women or men married with women. There is down low with men who have sex with men. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, there, there are there are relationships that speak to the to the day that there we're monogamous. We're all we're going to do stuff, but there are people in that relationship that choose to play on the side. And just as the same as we're talking about with men who are married to women who do it, it is still just as to me as wrong if you are married to a man or in a relationship with a man and you guys have established a relationship to be monogamous, whatever, and they are going behind the person's back and doing things with someone else. It's the, to me, it's the same thing. And it has the same potential repercussions and what have you with, with, you know, as with any other DL relationship. And I, and I think that calls back to what Hadrian was saying before, because his viewpoint is there was a time when it was us versus them. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a it was limited opportunity inventory, whatever you want to call it, as to who got what. And now that the playing field, so to speak, is more fair or equitable, it's it's a recognition of, oh, yeah, that's not cool. Like, it wouldn't we be cool We need those dirty tricks, yeah. Me. Right. Yeah, I think yeah. that that brings up a good point, David. I completely agree with you, and it's mm-hmm. not a clear situation when individuals, whether they're you know, no matter who they're in the relationship with, decide to mm-hmm. to make that decision. I think to to also kind of encapsulate like the feedback that we got, each person goes into it making their own decisions, their own justifications, their own whatever you want to call it, determining why they do what they do. I think it's very challenging to understand that because I think there's a a societal concept of right versus wrong, good versus bad, this whole moral, immoral thing that we grow up in, at least here in the U.S., that we have to pass judgment on an individual. We either are with them or against them. And I don't think that's really fair because we're not in their shoes. And I think amongst the four of us today, we've had some experiences that we can understand why people do what they do. We may or may not today necessarily agree with it, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to, you know, be hating on them or have a waiting to exhale moment and and burn their shit down. Like, that's just not my place and it's not my business. You know, Um, I I leave them to to their own undoing or life, I guess. That's why the first the first thing a man will say when he gets caught cheating is they didn't mean anything. That is the very first thing they will say. Usually, if it, if it's true, they will say, "Oh, she doesn't mean anything. He doesn't mean anything. Whatever it is, that they, they really want to mitigate it down to where, oh, it was a fling, not a thing. You know, they want to. There's there's that is the immediate thing that most men go to, especially when they're caught. And that it it really is up to the person to figure out what that really means. Yeah, and humans are messy, you know, gross individuals, and we do gross things as a society to each other. And you know, just because we're not killing each other doesn't mean we're not finding new and inventive ways to test the limits of what's acceptable to uh, to each other. Correct. Agreed. Well, that was such a lovely high note to end on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's Nobody a complicated thing, and I I, 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 I kind of want to make sure we don't go away endorsing down low stuff because it's 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 a complicated thing. It's it's not a right and wrong. It's a it's, it's 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 part of the human it's it's another uh thing another part of the human condition that we have to work our way through yeah, yeah. it's a gray it's definitely a gray you never know it's not going to be as easy as you think it's going to be ever mm-hmm. it can yeah be fun, I, though. I, I yeah damon i don't mm-hmm. disagree um yeah i don't well i don't i think we're focusing on like what actually happens as opposed to like the broader picture but uh, yeah it's I hate to say this, but I think a lot of it comes down to like communication. Are, are you, are you, is there awareness? Are you being open? 
both parties, all the parties, however many parties. Hey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and you, you have to make the best decision for yourself in the moment or yeah. before, during, and after maybe would be good as well. We'll see. And it, just be honest with your partner. Well, I'm from the South. Being honest doesn't always work. <laughs> I mean, I, something, something we didn't, I didn't mention in the beginning, and I know we're getting to the end here, but I'll be quick, is that you know, my introduction to being down low, so to say, the concept of it was something that I saw in my family. Like I saw that men, or even like in my neighborhoods, I saw where men were getting together, not explicitly, I didn't see them having sex, but you were aware that men were, some men were closer than others, and they were married or whatever they were doing, and but there was stuff on the side and that's just the way it was is is still at a lot of southern societies where being gay is now not just being not just being into men being gay is an entire political identity these days and i'm and i'm not sure if that's good or bad but there's definitely a lot of men who want to be down low and don't want to be challenged for the political positions they don't want to be you know told how they should be voting and stuff like that is because they like to suck dick and i i would i'm all about getting more soldiers to the blue cause but um so there are still a lot of men who engage in down low across the country. Just like, you know, I want to wear my MAGA hat and got and get fucked. So they don't what they don't, they understand that there's a juxtaposition between what they're doing and what people in their own camp believe. They don't believe they should be able to do that. Some people believe men should be able to have sex, but only in those down low situations they need to be, they need to be out there getting married and having babies and living straight masculine, heteronormative lifestyles. And they can do whatever they want in those little secret societies they get to put together or, you know, in back rooms or Craigslist or whatever they're using there. Are, there's, you know, I grew up in an environment where the men believe that's how they had to live. That down low was the default if you wanted to be into men. Otherwise, you had to get married and have kids. And I know because I saw men in my family doing it. And that I was told so. Like, there are things men do behind closed doors, but you have a duty to family and and your sis and you know and our culture to get married, have kids, and have a nine to five job and whatever else you're doing. Uh -huh. So there is an there's an element that pushes both ways, and it's it's worth realizing that you know. Life is complicated, and it's even yeah. more complicated today because gay identity is so ingrained with a bunch of other movements and other movements of the zeitgeist. I, I agree with you on that point, Hadrian. The the challenge is, I think people want things to move more rapidly than glacial, mm -hmm. and that's the challenge that we're looking at. Yeah, there was a time when no one gave a shit about you and your life, and then someone decided that it was appropriate because a uh, non corporeal voice from the clouds, or whatever you want to call it, gave them, you know, something to decide or wage measurement against other individuals, and it just complicates the entire situation. It's, mm -hmm. I think, it's possible we'll reach a day as a society, unless we burn the planet down first, that, you know, people will be able to be open and express themselves however they want in, in all the ways, you know, gender and relationship and all the rest of that jazz. But I don't know how soon that will happen. Cause I think there's a lot of, I agree with you, Hadrian, especially on the point about that. Now there's identity that words have far more impact and what that ties to. And it's unfortunate, right. you know, the people just can't, choose to be themselves and individuals but i look to this is gonna oh. sound really cliche i look to children and the younger generation to like kind of be the future of it when i see when i see beings choosing um to be non-binary to choose gender neutral pronouns to choose gender neutral naming to do a lot of things to say i'm not gonna follow your structure anymore it's it's very kind of like up with all of society to say i'm just gonna be me so quit trying to pigeonhole me and tell me what gender I am or how to reference myself or what kind of a relationship to be in or how to have sex with people. Right. So maybe generationally it'll take a while, a few, a couple, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to a point where they'll look back and they'll look at an archive of this silly little podcast and be like, oh, look at them. They were so silly back in that. They talked about this <laughs> thing and we don't even have it anymore. <laughs> Who knows? I guess that folks. That's the end. Aw. Aw. The play ways to contact us, you can pop over to our website, CubsOutloud.com. Shoot us an email at CubsOutloud at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail, sexy or otherwise, just like uh, Daddy Hadrian had done earlier. Not today. Uh -huh. 
month ago? I don't remember. Yeah, it was a while back. Yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's uh, 361 COL Talk. That's 361 265 8255. Uh, put that in your phone so you can speed dial us. Uh, you can <laughs> find us on, your, on various social media outlets uh, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and YouTube. Right here on YouTube. Uh, hit subscribe. Click the bell button to get notifications. Um, that comes out loud in the appropriate place of the URL. Uh, you can join our entourage social chat at tinyurl.com slash telegram dash col where we have some brand spanking new stickers. Woo-hoo! Thanks to uh, 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 the Smashy. Yes. <laughs> we paid him. Don't worry. We, we <laughs> for, for his job. Uh, with with actual moolah, not yeah, with favors. Money. Yeah. I don't think he, he would have taken it for it, although he would appreciate that. Um, you can also uh, find out when we're going to be recording these shows. Um, lately, it's been on um, Sunday mornings, but um, you, you can follow us on our calendar at tinyworld.com slash calendar dash C-O-L. You can subscribe to that. Uh, you can support us by getting merch from our merch store at zazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud, or you can get shirts like this long sleeve, or actually whatever sleeve shirt, uh, Version uh, alternate version of our uh, version two logo, uh, sweatshirt like Gary has on, and uh, you can also subscribe to us uh, as a patron. Come and patron at patreon.com slash comes out loud, uh, where you get the uh, audio version earlier, um, like a day earlier or something, whenever I get it edited and ready for audio. Um, and also join for patron hangouts. The next one should be at the end of December. So coming up in about a month and a half here. Uh, or it'll be a Christmas celebration or something. I don't know. We haven't gotten the full plans on the, what specifically to do for the patron hangout. You can rate us on iTunes. Subscribe to us on Google Play Podcasts. Give us a thumbs up on Stitcher Radio. You can find me anywhere on the internet. as box that box probably box cub box. Up there, there. Um, I am Theater Cub Seven Nine on Growler and um, Tumblr and Facebook, or you can find me as Pup underscore Umbra on Twitter. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me someplace online. Just type in G A R B E A R seven three Gabriel seven three ScreamingQueen dot com. <gasps> you got it backwards. <laughs> Turn it around. Uh, it's backwards. There, there you go. go. The shade was so good, it was backwards. <laughs> and for any of you shady bitches out there who want to talk with that hot daddy Hadrian, how would they reach out to you? The Hadrian Show dot com. Ah, nice, nice, <laughs> quick, easy, and simple. Yes. The Hadrian Show. Oh, uh, Tub says we should have a Santa hangout. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. Is that where Santa hang lets his sack hang out? Uh, yes. Everybody <laughs> knows about me and Santa's. You That's guys should same. totally like do the the Santa baby bit from Mean Girls. Really. <laughs> <laughs> We're going. Take it out, everybody. <laughs> Have a good one, y'all. Bye, everyone. Bye. Sloppy Bottom 23 with something totally different, go guy. What? We do have Sloppy Bottom 23 shirts on the store, but... Oh. That was, a, <clears throat> that was another uh, old COL reference. It would help if I got on mute. Uh, it was a previous episode inside kind of joke thing. That someone's nickname was Sloppy Bottom 23. Oh, wow. Well. So that was from...
Well, you could uh, go search for it on our website, I'm sure. Yeah. Just type in sloppy bottom and see what happens. <laughs> David, our scribe, as the as the master of, of keyword we'll tags, we'll we'll probably it. be able to hopefully no, search I'm, that out. I'm wondering if I had put that like in the description of the... Um... The shirt. The shirt. Oh, I don't know. Good point. Uh, they're currently twenty. You're still muted, Damon. I know Sloppy Bottom twenty three was a hat. Oh no, it wasn't. Oh oh, whoops. That's I thought Sloppy Bottom twenty three was a four forty eight. Hey, remember on CLL four forty eight when we came up with Sloppy Bottom twenty three? Well, here's a shirt inspired by it. Nice. <laughs> Huh. I'm curious I'm to know. So I'm mad. <laughs> if I wanted to, I can transfer this to a button. I should probably do that. <laughs> uh, um, and, and also, when the recommendations was transferring it to pet clothing. Um, oh, <laughs> Zazzle. You want a sloppy bottom 23 apron? No. So silly. Oh, the topic for COL 448 was shutdowns in real life versus online. Yeah, because I think we're like, I think I remember Sloppy Bottom 23 being like the fake name of a <laughs> um, someone's um, screen name. It was a fake screen name. Yeah, it was our ra- just somebody <laughs> shouted out. Oh, I think it was Gary. I don't remember. Well, I was I probably to... having a witty moment and just said something off the cuff and... Everybody was titillated, and we laughed and guffawed, and then somebody called me Sloppy Bottom 24. So, yeah. That's a thing. Well, you know, we always have to have a thing. Uh-huh. I don't know about that. Of it. Um... So the the chat I love the chat talking about like Santa's and I'm like yeah by the way um my my boy my husband well my husband not my husband but my partner Mm-mm. is a I I would call it semi professional Santa yeah in that he 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 does it he does it usually basically around his time um but he's not like like there are Santas that are like well we talk to one that are like to me professional Santas and they go to tours and you know all that stuff and events and everything yes Adrian are you having Santa sex with your Santa daddy I'm gonna no. stop 